couple of years back, I came across a photography book in which the photographer had two different pictures of the same scene. The larger was the one that he preferred, and the second one was the one he showed to give a sense of what was better about the larger one. And seeing the two photographs right next to each other was very educational. Because you could see that, yes, the larger one was better. Not because it was larger, but for a lot of other reasons. It was a good book for training your eye. Whether you're planning to become a photographer yourself or just wanting to learn how to appreciate photography, it's good to have your eye trained that way. Having something to compare. So you can see, yes, this is different from that, this is better than that. And you begin to understand why. It's the same with meditation. We're here comparing mind states. We're trying to get the mind into a better state than it normally would be if it was just left to its own devices. And getting a sense of what's more skillful, what's less skillful. It's good to have comparisons. This is one of the reasons why you have to meditate so much, so you can begin to have a range of comparisons as to what kind of concentration is skillful concentration, what kind of concentration is a little foggy, when you're putting too much pressure on it, when you're not putting enough. You need things to compare. And this is a skillful use of the comparing mind. The Buddha calls this analysis of qualities. It's one of the factors for awakening. He defines it very simply as making the distinction between what's skillful and what's not. And of course, skillful has many levels. And Bodun made a similar comment one time. He said, once the mind gets still, you start comparing things. He said, things that are dark, things that are bright. Meaning, of course, states of mind. You compare the results of what you're doing so you get a sense of what's skillful and what's not. Then you have to connect the results to what you're doing, so you can get a sense of how to change what you're doing if it's not coming out the way you want it, or if there are better ways of doing it. This willingness to ask these questions is what keeps your meditation alive. Otherwise, you start drifting off, getting kind of drowsy, trying to get the mind to stay with one thing, and as it stays with one thing, it begins to get dull, because the mind is used to jumping around. Liking this, liking that, then deciding he doesn't like this, running over there, something else. And it gets entertained as it jumps around. But here we're asking you to stay still, but still and alert. And one of the best ways of staying alert is to ask questions. Simple things. Start with simple things, like what kind of breath does the body need now? Breathe a certain way for a while, then change it. Just breathe another way. And then compare. And if you're not sure about the results of your comparison, we'll try something else. Breathe in a different way, and then a different way, until you finally get a sense that the breath has this kind of influence on the mind, has this kind of influence on the body. And then you can start learning how to read what the body needs, because it's not the case that there is one ideal breath for concentration. Sometimes when the body is tired, it needs an energizing breath. When it's tense, it needs one that's more relaxing. When you're carrying some issues in from the day, sometimes you have to do some work first to get the mind ready to stay with the breath. That's something you've got to learn how to read, too. So to read, you have to compare. All too often we hear that you shouldn't make a use of the comparing mind in your meditation. And if you're just on a meditation retreat for a weekend or so, 
that might be good advice. Otherwise, you get all tied up in knots. But if you're thinking of meditation as a lifelong activity, which is it, which it is, you're working on developing the mind, and the mind is always going to need developing one way or another until you reach full awakening. There's always more work to be done. And the more work you do, the more you benefit. So if you think of this as a lifelong activity, you've got to learn how to compare. Otherwise, the meditation doesn't become a skill. It's just a random shot in the dark. You shoot up in the air, maybe once in a while you get something to fall down. But there's no skill, there's no system to it, there's no science to it. It's just, it's all very random. You don't want your meditation to be random. Certain causes lead to certain results, and a large part of discernment is seeing the connection between causes and results and having a sense of which ones are better. And as you learn to ask yourself these questions, it gets you out of the dullness of a concentration that's just sitting there getting drowsier and duller and drowsier and duller. You have to take an interest in what's going on in your mind. Part of this, of course, requires learning how to figure out when's a good time to ask questions and when do you just stick with the one object. That's something you've got to learn how to read, too. If you ask too many questions, then you get pulled away. You ask the right kinds of questions. And the number one question to avoid is, is my meditation better than somebody else's? Or is it worse than somebody else's? Or am I a better person than somebody else? Or that kind of comparing mind is to be put aside. If you want to look at, okay, is someone else doing something better than I am? And this can be measured in many different ways. Sometimes we find that we get good at a particular skill, and other people are not quite as good in the technical side of the skill. And there's some pride that comes around that. But then other people may bring, be bringing a better attitude. So if you find yourself comparing yourself with other people, try to focus in on the actions. And even then, you have to learn how to look all around. And John Mahabur talks about the pride he developed in, or the fact that he was able to observe the ascetic practices better than any other monk staying with Ajahn, Ajahn Mun. But Ajahn Mun would every now and then do a little something to get in the way of Ajahn Mahabur's Tatanga practice, just to show him, show him that it's not all about the ability to stick to the rules. There's a quality of the heart, there's a quality of the attitude, the pride that you've got to watch out for. Being really good is something that's all around. And because we tend to side with ourselves, we have to be very careful about this. How we measure what's skillful and what's not. We have to learn how to use our comparing mind skillfully if we're going to get some benefit out of it. Again, this is one of the reasons why people are warned about comparing mind, but just saying, well, don't compare, you never learn anything that way. You have to learn how to compare different ways of comparing to see which ones are more useful, which ones get more rounded results. So look at your actions and see if you can look at them from many different angles to see what's lacking. Sometimes you say with the meditation, you may be doing the technique okay, but something else is lacking. Either the ability to ask the right questions, or just having a sense of what's better than, than what. What kind of mind state is really useful for the practice? What kind of mind states actually get in the way? Even though they may seem nice on the surface, you've got to live with these things for a while to really read them. So the ability to develop a skill, to develop some maturity in your comparing mind.
That's what helps develop the meditation as a genuine skill, an all-around skill. Something that changes not only the state of your mind, but also changes the state of your heart. Because we're training the whole heart and the whole mind, not just part of it. So your powers of judgment should learn to be all around, looking at things from many angles. That way the meditation becomes more than just a skill. It can lead to a real revolution inside.